Um, good evening. My name is Richard Joy, and I'm the executive director of ULI Toronto. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all here to our ninth annual fireside chat. As tradition dictates, we have assembled an amazing panel of city builders tonight. Our program committee is to be especially congratulated for putting together a program which has become another ULI tradition, which is a sellout. Um, amazing, amazing. Over 300 people registered for this event, just wonderful. Um, who would be surprised, though, that uh, when we bring three diamonds together, we would get a full house? That's my... Bad, eh? <laughs> First, I would like to thank our sponsors uh, uh, for making tonight possible. Um, our fireside chat uh, would not be possible without their very generous support. So uh, I'd like to just uh, acknowledge um, Bousfields, ERA, Architects, and Rio Can for their very, very generous support. Thank you very much. Okay, before I set our program into full roll, I want to first acknowledge that today, of course, is International Women's Day, which we're going to hear more about uh, later as well. Uh, ULI, as people probably know, is, as, is dedicated to the advancement of women's leadership through our many initiatives that increase the visibility and career advancement opportunities for women in our industry. Ornella Ricicci, Ricicci rather, um, our Women's Leadership Initiative co-chair, uh, will close out our program with more details of our ever-expanding efforts to deliver on this mission, including our second Women on Boards event and our third annual Women in the Spotlight initiative. Um, but I want to underscore a piece of work that uh, uh, is also underway and, and uh, leadership of, of which is also in the room, and that's our She With He initiative, which very importantly ensures that this mission is one that is equally taken up by men. We must all be committed to advancing a more gender inclusive world and hashtag be bold for change. Turning to tonight's program, we will uh, admit that our invitation of Jack, Sarah and Steve Diamond to our podium had an element of marketing flair to it. Um, <laughs> but in reality, it is that their, com their, their common last names is mostly a coincidence as each of our panelists is truly at the top of their fields and brings to our stage incredible perspectives from their remarkable careers. Um, and these, of course, are the ingredients for a great fireside chats over the years, and I know will be tonight. Uh, in our panel, we have assembled the city leaders in the fields of education, architect architecture, and development. The dominant thread, or so we thought, uh, is design. Um, design excellence is a signature of each of our panel's career pursuits. But in our pre-call discussion, it became very clear that urban and architectural design won't be the only topic that this, pop, this panel wants to cover. I think we can expect an expansive and electric discussion about the broader state of our city and region. Veterans of past fireside chats will, chats will know that tonight is an opportunity to get to know some of the biographical details of our panelists and take a retrospective look at their careers to get their commenta commentary on our city's evolution. In recent years, however, the focus of these discussions has shifted more to the current challenges and future opportunities. How can our past thus inform our future? You will notice this year, hard not to, that we have assembled three panelists, all of which with, with uniquely interesting stories to tell. Um, we've asked Steve Diamond to serve in the dual role <coughs> as moderator and panelist. He will thus drive the dialogue and participate fully in the discussion. So thank you, Steve, for taking that on, a challenging role, I know. In doing so, Steve will more properly introduce Jack and Sarah, um, so, and he will be asking them questions about their incredible careers to, to tease some more details out. As such, though, please allow me to introduce some details about Steve himself before I turn the program over to him. Stephen Diamond is the president and CEO of Diamond Corp, a Toronto-based real estate development company. Since 2008, Diamond Corp's investments total more than 15,000 residential units in, in excess of 17 million square feet of residential office and retail gross floor area in the development of the City of Toronto. Some signature projects include uh, the well, many people would know that, uh, referred to as enlightened urbanism by the City Urban Design Review Panel, 5 St. Joseph Street, the Celestica site, that's 60 acres, I think that makes it the city's largest private development site by acreage. I know there's a 
maybe a quarrel by floor area that uh, might belong to uh, another development. Um, Garrison Point, point uh, uh, at King and Strawn, Blue Diamond at Avenue Road in St. Clair, and very recently and importantly, the newly acquired Imperial Oil Lands in Port Credit in partnership with Dream, Kilmore, and Fram. Prior to the creation of Diamond Corp, Stephen served as a partner in the law firm of McCartney Tetro, where he was head of municipal law and planning, which uh, is where I first met him, and his wife, Karen, who's also with us here tonight. Welcome, Karen. Um, throughout his career, Steve has served on a number of community and industrial-related boards and committees, including Waterfront Toronto and Sunnybrook Hospital. And lastly, and I didn't know this, uh, but Steve founded PAY, P-A-Y-E, which stands for the Partnership to Advance Youth and Employment. Um, this is an initiative I'm quite familiar with from my days at the Board of Trade, um, and, uh, and it's an initiative that is driven with the city that has provided over 2,000 permanent jobs to youth living in our priority neighborhoods in Toronto. Amazing, amazing work. I didn't know that. That's uh, one of many nuggets I think we're going to find out tonight. Um, with this, as promised, I'm now going to turn the floor over to Steve, who will expand on the introductions of Sarah and Jack to launch ULI's Toronto's 2017 Fireside Chat. Steve. Okay, thank you, uh, Richard. Um, it's a great uh, honor to be here and to be sharing uh, this podium uh, with such two such uh, prominent and established people who share the last name with me. Um, I, can, uh, I can tell you, it, it was humbling to look at their CVs. Uh, for example, you know, both of them uh, have the Order of Ontario. I just want everyone to know my application is pending. Um, having said all that, I'll just start off uh, with Sarah, who is uh, president of OCAD University, uh, but she comes from an amazingly uh, diverse background, uh, born in the United States, but she's also an artist, uh, and in fact, uh, you would think that maybe from uh, OCAD, but uh, she has works that are currently uh, in MoMA, as well as the National Gallery of Canada. But on top of that, uh, she holds a PhD in computer technology and engineering, from the University of East London, a master's in digital media, an honors of Bachelor of Arts in History and Communication. Uh, Toronto Life called her one of the most influential 50 people in the city of Toronto. And she also, uh, it's just too much to say, sits on numerous uh, volunteer boards uh, within the city and obviously has made a great contribution uh, to our city. So welcome to the panel, Sarah. And Jack uh, Diamond, who um, uh, I've known for many years, uh, a world-famous architect. Again, uh, looking through um, his curriculum vitae, uh, little things that, uh, that I found out uh, that I didn't know. Uh, but not only does he have a Bachelor of Architecture, he has a Master's of Arts, Politics, Philosophy, and Economics from Oxford University, and a Master of Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he has sat on things like the Ontario Human Rights Commission, the National Capital Commission in Ottawa. He has been the winner and his firm has won numerous architectural awards, some of the highest or the highest awards that are given in Canada. And in fact, um, World Architecture in the UK has said that the firm of Diamond and Schmidt is one of the top 10 uh, in the world. And as I've said early, uh, a holder of the Order of Ontario and the Order of Canada. So welcome, Jack. And, uh, <laughs> And I might have been remiss, but I'm sure everybody knows that he was the architect for the Four Seasons Center uh, in Toronto, uh, as well as um, in Washington, the Performing Arts Center there, uh, and are doing work in, in St. Petersburg, Russia. So uh, a, few, uh, a few worldwide perspectives. So we're going to talk about a lot of things tonight, but I just thought I would ask uh, both Sarah and Jack to start off with. And, you know, there's an old saying that I heard uh, that John Lennon said, life's uh, what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. So I wanted to ask uh, uh, both Sarah and Jack, maybe I'll start, Sarah, with you. I mean, how did you end up with this career where you had all these different backgrounds into where you are today, just, just very briefly? So, um, yeah, you know, you know there's, there's persistence in the interests. So I've always been very um, engaged in learning. I was one of those extremely precocious, curious, um, kids who drove their teachers crazy. 
Um, and uh, very early um, on, I was involved in developing alternate models of learning. So I actually helped to found something called SEED, which is an alternate school that still exists in Toronto. Um, and um, that pathway of, of engaging with how people learn and building models for learning um, really is also about design thinking. So that's one strand that's really followed me through many years. Um, and so I've always had some level of engagement with educational institutions. I um, taught at Emily Carr College of Art and Design. Um, I was a social historian before I became an artist. And um, I was always very interested in people's stories that were not available, but also in data. So you're going to see this through trend there. So you know, large historical surveys that can help you understand populations, so kind of ethnographic history when I became a historian. I jumped into being an artist because I just felt that um, academic publishing didn't communicate with the people I wanted to relate to. And so I had a very successful um, artistic career teaching. And um, I was also, um, and you'll hear it tonight, I've always been very opinionated. So um, I felt very comfortable um, expressing my views on the status of artists and on education. So I kind of got hooked in by the federal government to a number of um, what they used to do a lot, which were sort of royal commissions. And through that process, um, I made some remarks about the Banff Center, fabulous national institution in Alberta. And I was plucked for this reason out of LA, where I'd moved to teach, to the Banff Center. And I ran a program there for 14 years that basically grew, founding something called the Banff New Media Institute. So I kind of fell into the world of um, emerging new and digital media. As an artist, I'd begun to tinker um, with programming my own stuff, kind of messing around with technologies. I've never been shy about technology. Um, and through that process of both working with essentially the big, big Silicon Valley boom of the 1990s, running an institute which was really a think tank, a kind of Davos-like think tank in the future of technologies, and then ending up making some software, because I just thought I would do that. Um, at a certain point in time, um, I loved being at Banff. I also realized I had to reverse engineer the software, went and got a degree in computer science, a PhD. So I'm a genuine computer scientist. Um, all the work I do is about data analytics and now visualization, you know, in terms of that particular path. So there's the education path. There's the art creativity path. My whole approach to software was from a creative and design perspective. And we're going to talk about technology tonight in the city, in cities. Um, and then after a number of years at Banff, um, I was um, headhunted to come and uh, be the president of OCAD University. And uh, OCAD at the time was just making the transition to being a university. And I thought, what a wonderful challenge to uh, actually come back to Toronto, where I had not lived for many decades, um, and lead the transition of you know, really one of Canada's most important institutions. It's 141 years old. Um, and take it from being a great art and design school to being a world-class university um, that has the capacity to understand the complexity um, of the world we live in and provide design thinking, creativity, and data analytics, as well as great art. So that's the path, and it does make sense. OK. <laughs> Jack. Well, uh, I can say that I've been really lucky. I've had some terrible things happen to me. Uh, that sounds odd, but uh, they turned out to be good. Uh, the first one was that I tried to integrate my swimming pool during the apartheid era in South Africa, and that put me on the police list that night. Um, and as a consequence, uh, when there was a state of emergency declared, my wife and I had to go sleep somewhere else to avoid arrest, because in South Africa, if you were arrested, you were often shot and thrown out of the door and said they were trying to escape. So it wasn't a very pleasant time. And uh, we decided that notwithstanding all of the things that my family had done and been to and <clears throat> achieved in South Africa, decided to immigrate. And we immigrated with about $400, because you were allowed to take money out. And uh, from there went to, uh, the, to the United States to do a graduate degree when I was recruited to teach at the University of Toronto. And uh, I, when I arrived here, I thought I'd made the biggest mistake of my life. Uh, in 1964, Toronto was a, uh, a city of what I thought of mediocre architecture and Presbyterian morals. <laughs> Extraordinarily uptight, 
uh, very boring and very ordinary. But I didn't realize at the time that it was on the cusp of this extraordinary change. Mm -hmm. And the next thing that happened to me that was really good is that I got fired from the University of Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> it was very fortunate. Um, it forced me to look elsewhere and think about practice and theory going together. And uh, one thing led to another, and I remember uh, we, uh, there was a very charming couple that I got to know uh, who uh, had a small medical clinic up in, uh, uh, up in Richmond Hill, and they, after about five years of not getting any work, uh, teaching part-time, running the professional journal, just as an immigrant, and fortunately when I was an immigrant, I was not asked about my uh, Canadian values. Um, I actually asked them about Canadian values. But uh, I, anyway, the, the, to put a long story short, this couple asked me to design this thing, and I did, and I said to them, unfortunately, if you're going to use it as a clinic and you really want to make some money out of it, as much as I'm dying to do something, it won't work. They thanked me for my opinion, and uh, later on, she became head of the OMA, the Ontario Medical Association, which she insisted that we do the work. I got a little recommendation by them too to uh, Wookie, so I did York Square. And with that base, I was traveling. Uh, the way I got to know about Canada <clears throat> was that by being editor of the Architects Journal, I would make a trip across the country once a year to meet our representative in each city and uh, they would inevitably take me. I was supposed to be looking for things to publish, and they always took me to their job first, of course, and I learned how to say something diplomatically about the thing, and they'd show me a, a house, and I'd say, wow, that's a house. <laughs> and uh, I'd go to an office building, and I'd say, wow, that's an office building. They'd say, really, you think so? Yeah. It's... <laughs> so I got to know about the country quite well, and one of them, when the uh, vice president of the, and I wrote some articles that were really critical of a very prominent architect in the city. And he called me up and really gave me, I had to hunt the phone out like here. Uh, he really gave me a hard time. <clears throat> but it needed a critique. Why is fr f f uh, food so good in France? Because people are critical about it when it isn't. So Canadians were not that good at criticizing things. The politeness sometimes meant that you weren't getting good critical material. So I made a bad reputation for myself by being really critical in a column that came out on the monthly, uh, monthly uh, edition of them. And one of them <coughs> said to the vice president of the University of Alberta, when the vice president asked him, who would you recommend uh, to do your master plan. And he said, well, here's a local guy who'd do a decent job, and I'd been writing about the bad things that universities were doing. And I'm going to tell you a moment about that. They were building as if it was in Florida. Uh, buildings widely separated. I thought in the, in the spring when the snow melted, they'd find the students never made it across the courtyard. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, really, un, uh, and then building it outside of a city like St. Catharines, Brock got built when St. Catharines, was, St. Catharines was dying. Why would you put it out there? Why not put it in the town? Finally, 40 years later, they're doing what I said. It takes time. <laughs> so the, uh, the, this man said to him, you know, but if you want somebody who'll really tell you what the, what the truth is, try Jack Diamond. So he came to, he flew and saw, said to me, what have you done? I said, I've done New York Square. He said, what else? I said, that's my, that's my only suit. It's my best suit. Anyway, he had faith. He hired us. And as a consequence of that and a few other things, we got a lot of exposure. So I think uh, one of them was fighting developers, uh, doing bad things. And uh, but the profession really said to me, you're biting the hand that feeds you. And I said, there's a difference between business and a profession. Profession has a public duty. There's an ethic involved. In, in the private sector, you have a duty to your corporation, and that's all. You don't have to do anything more. You can if you're enlightened, but you don't have to. Profession, you have to. And I thought that we needed to reinforce the fact that the public interest is completely part of the social dimension that changes buildings to architecture. That's enough.
So let's, let's take that theme now. Uh, 1964, you came, you know, the city was, uh, you know, you were a little disappointed. Uh, now we've gone through this tremendous growth. And um, so I'd like to ask you, um, some people say, you know, we're living in the best city of the world, we're growing, it's, everything's perfect, it's fantastic, uh, we've got great fundamentals. And others say, you know what, uh, we've fallen behind and we need dramatic steps uh, to keep up. Um, so what, where do you sit on that, Jack, today? Well, the, the good thing about the 1960s was that for the first half of the, or the first almost two-thirds of the 20th century, this, the governance system, the land use, the transportation, and the density were in sync. Single-tier government system, most importantly, the boundaries of the wards uh, defined homogenous groups who understood the boundaries of the ward, and because they were reasonably socially homogenous, the, their values had to be clearly represented at council. As that changed, and we were very adept at making shifts, we went to a metropolitan form of government as the city grew. We had two tiers. It didn't all end in tiers, but the, okay, that was a pun. <laughs> uh, the upper tier looked at uh, city-wide issues and took care of stuff like the transportation right across the city, and the local councillor looked at local things, and it worked very well. <clears throat> it began to grow beyond that. And in fact, I was one of the best professional experiences I've ever had has been on Anne Golden's commission, who's here tonight, the Golden Commission that looked at land use, taxation, uh, transportation and, and density for the city and, and uh, the city of, and planning for the city of Toronto, and we realized that it was no longer a mid-sized provincial city. It was no longer simply a metropolis, and today, it is in fact a city region. The, there's an old thing in physics and in chemistry, and a sufficient change in degree is a change in kind. It's a different animal we have now. And our governance system, our taxation system, our planning system is absolutely inadequate to the task. So, Sarah, how, how do you think we're going to go on about these that. challenges? <laughs> <laughs> Don't cut me off. I'm just going. going. I'm just getting going. Well, okay, I'll, I'll come back. I'll okay. come back. You know, um, well, I, I'm I'm um, I'm more optimistic than than Jack is actually. Um, I, I think we're on a cusp that's incredibly exciting, and I want to talk about some of those moments. And um, we do have some agreement about um, some of what needs to happen, I think, next. But um, you know, we have an opportunity in terms of the capacity of, of the Toronto region, um, the greater Toronto region, and also Waterloo. Um, we have um, an economic engine um, in this area, in these connected areas that's unprecedented. We have the capacity to build, um, you know, what gets called, it's take two on Silicon Valley North, um, but a kind of tech um, capacity, but really um, married to the phenomenal design skills, um, cultural capacity, diversity that we have in our regions, and Hamilton's part of that as well. So I think we're in this phenomenal moment of potential growth where we can combine really important human values um, with really great design and uh, the kind of technology, knowledge and capacity, which is not just an export, but actually about um, something that we can do together in this region. So that's one point. Um, the second is, um, I just love the diversity of you know, the greater Toronto environment. It is so unique in terms of the cultural diversity, um, the ways that there's a complexity around cultural expression, the way people live their lives. There's a richness, a density. I mean, we see it with our students all the time. It is so exciting as a city. And uh, we have to be really aware of that. I think we need to really um, look at issues of um, affordability. I think they're very pronounced, um, you know, not only in the downtown core, but also the inner suburbs. Uh, we need to have a kind of ethics um, about what is the city that we want. Where do we want to live? What are its values? And I do believe that development and planning has to be values driven. So, you know, we are in a moment where artists are being driven out of Toronto, without question. I mean, they're moving, you know, to Hamilton. Um, they're moving out of the city. That is a point of crisis. 
Um, the city is not affordable for students. And we have three other universities in our city that are leaders, uh, four universities, us a little <laughs> tiny engine there. And honestly, our students are struggling incredibly to be able to live in the city. That's a point of crisis. Um, and we also are moving towards more and more economic disparity um, in a city where actually we've managed diversity and disparity relatively well. So that requires you know, um, tremendous coordination of efforts. It requires planning that is cross-regional. Um, it's not only about the city. It requires a province that is going to also let um, urban clusters at the scale of Toronto um, and the GTA make decisions and follow through on those decisions. Um, and I think it also requires a kind of uh, technology infrastructure and smart city coordination and infrastructure, which I know we'll talk about later, um, that we're just beginning to put into place here. And we are about 10 years behind in that in terms of um, the kind of GTA capacity. Um, but I'm optimistic partly by nature. I lead a university. You have to be an optimist. You're working with the next generations. Um, but I also see all these kind of countervailing um, really exciting capacities growing, you know, within our region, as well as the kind of challenges that I think Jack has outlined uh, uh, very succinctly and is very passionate about. So I remember I was uh, here last year, and um, Will Flessing, who took over Waterfront Toronto on this point, said, you know, Toronto's at, a, at the point now where it really hasn't defined itself on the world stage in terms of what it wants to be. And, you know, Sarah, I hear you're really optimistic, but you've raised issues that are very go to the core of, of a healthy region, city region, you know, affordability, uh, transit, infrastructure. And Jack, I hear you saying, look, I think we have problems. The governance isn't working. Um, uh, what, you know, Jack, what, what, do you, what do you see then? What, do you're, you know, what would you say in terms of the governance? How would, you, how would you change things to handle these challenges? Well, obviously, uh, in order to get the coordination and cooperation of the 27 municipalities and four regional governments that make up the city region. You require a mechanism in which the, the, the vector is moving forward in a powerful way. I don't disagree that we have the ingredients to be possibly the best metropolitan area in the world. I know that sounds extravagant, but I really think so. Because in, in the larger sense, and it's becoming more and more evident, Australia and Canada are the best of the Western democracies. Uh, there is a spectacularly good accommodation of diversity. Uh, we do have stability in our political system. But the problem in the United States and in many parts of Europe is when the incomes diverge too greatly between the minority and the majority. In fact, Canada over the last decade has gone from being ninth in the world on the, on the, on the question of uh, the, the gap to 19th in the world in a decade on the income spread. And what's happened is, what's happened in Paris when the uh, outer suburbs became the uh, place for immigrants to live and where the unemployment was high and where there was no access to public services, it exploded and became riot and burning of the suburbs. The Hulchansky report, a phenomenally important report uh, produced by the University of Toronto, has shown that since the 1970s, the shift between a reasonably integrated city where low income groups were close to the core with high income group and that the, the, middle, the middle segment was just outside of that is now shifted. The low income groups are on the perimeter, the high income groups expanded and the middle is shrunk. And this means that the low income group are out of sight, out of mind. They, do, they have the poorest transportation they have no access to public services. As a consequence, there's a structural problem here that needs addressing. So with all of the benefits that we have, which is, are spectacular, and it's still seen as the most livable city, notwithstanding all the problems, it's one of the richest metropolitan areas in North America, and we're now fourth in, the, in population after New York, Mexico City, and Los Angeles. So the power possible, the power potential, is what, what irks me is the power is there but it's not being harnessed, it's not being leveraged in a way that would make it spectacularly good. Let me give you an example. London, and this is old numbers, it's got worse. London invests per capita in transit every year over $1,100 per head. Berlin, 830. Uh, 
New York about 750, Toronto 337. And in 1949, when we began building the subway, we were not as wealthy then as we are now. The city council didn't have debt timidity. They borrowed money because if you borrow money and waste it, of course that's bad. But if you borrow money to invest to build capacity, then you're doing well. That's what we're not doing. We've got tremendous debt timidity. We're not investing in our public infrastructure. We're way behind. And I think that we're not leveraging it. So what do you, the answer to your question is, we need a governance system in which we'll coordinate the efforts across the region. We need to have the growth plan <clears throat> that the province has way updated to take into account land use and transportation. And we need a tri-level government to sit down and decide where the monies in Canada should go for infrastructure. What's well understood is that cities are engines of growth. What isn't well understood is that not the hub cities, and hub cities are defined by those cities that have more than 40% of the GDP of their regional province, are the drivers of the national economy on a regional basis. And we've got nine hub cities in Canada. We've got a federal government that's willing to spend infrastructure money, but it's not doing it in a strategic way that would leverage the nine cities to have its impacts on its regions. So we need the federal government, the provincial government, and the, and the, uh, as the, as, uh, the cities who have no tax base to cope with this kind of thing, to really organize it so that it is a coordinated effort in order to take advantage of all the benefits, and one of them clearly is the choice of our quality of life is so, what makes us so attractive. So just on, um, on that point, you know, it's really interesting. We want the governments to do more, um, but it gets very difficult to get them to do more. Um, and it's interesting because I was reading that Winston Churchill once said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all other forms of government. <laughs> so we live in a democratic system and, um, you know, it does have its, its problems. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because, Sarah, you and Jack have both talked on something that I've discovered through the pay program when I uh, was out in, the, in, in Toronto's inner suburbs, which are suffering, um, and the lack of opportunities, and the Helchinsky report, which I've read, um, which shows that, that the core of the city, you know, we think we have a really healthy city, but the inner suburbs are, are getting poorer and poorer. So I have uh, personally met with... Um, the mayor, the, the deputy mayor, the planning commissioner. I've put forward proposals to these people to help get my industry to move out there, um, but nobody seems to, to care or to take action because what happens is the political winds of the day take hold and we get a decision to either approve the Scarborough subway or take away tolls um, because these are political decisions that take more granted. So Sarah, I'm going to ask you, because you've done so much in your life, I know you're not political, but maybe you are, and you can tell us the answer. I mean, you know, what, how do you get, Jack's talked about getting governments to move. Right. Uh, I try to get governments to move. I'm not very successful. You know, what do you do when there's these issues that are clearly out there? I think we probably uh, all agree right. on that issue, okay. but it's very hard to get people to move on so it. So I do have something very specific to say to, to this, this community or this set of communities, which is that, um, uh, development has been and continues to be an incredible engine, um, you know, in Toronto. Um, and um, there is a capacity in this room, and it's perfect to be having this conversation in the Toronto Regional Board of Trade. I mean, I'm working with them very closely on uh, their Smart City Working Group. Um, they're very engaged with really trying to build those relationships between the private sector um, and, the, and, and Toronto's government, but beyond. But I actually believe that um, you know, the developer community and some of the more successful business communities in the GTA have a real role to play right now because um, so many people were building their businesses over many years. And now there's considerable wealth and capacity and you know, the city is still being built and you're the people building it. And I know that governments respond to the private sector in a way that they don't respond, um, even though um, Jack is a brilliant and articulate spokesperson for the kind of transformation that's needed and does have an impact, and I'm a lobbyist for all kinds of interests on the part of the university community, there's a power in this room which is really phenomenal. 
And you have the power to continue to convene that conversation. So I think the discussion about you know, what are the values that need to drive um, Toronto, but also the GTA, and um, you know, how can business leaders step up to not only look at something like a Toronto Waterloo Corridor, which is an innovation corridor, which tends to be very much the dialogue is about wealth generation, and there too, um, but really about what is the social fabric you know, that we want to see, and then what are the things that can happen on um, the tri, the federal, provincial, and municipal levels that can bring those into, into reality. So I, I believe that there's a role as almost never before for business communities to play in driving the dialogue from a humanist perspective. Um, the kind of things that you may be currently an individual voice around are things that this community can speak very loudly about. Um, I'm involved with um, an effort that we initiated with the University of Toronto, this is OCAD U and U of T, looking at public art in, uh, in Toronto and uh, looking at the kind of uh, policies we have right now for public art. And the developer community has played an incredible role in building public art capacity in the city. I mean, that's where a great deal of the money is, has come from historically. And what we're looking at is how can we make that resource available to the inner suburbs? How, how can we plan more effectively with this community to make strategic investments, like on the waterfront, for large public art spaces, which are not about um, prettifying the city, but about public art as a way of creating sociality, culture, play spaces, <clears throat> you know, for kids, working um, with architects, working with city planning. And again, there's been a phenomenal amount of investment by this community in transforming the, the city, but it needs to be better coordinated. So um, I genuinely think there's a power in this room that um, maybe needs to be convened more consistently to really uh, work with the city of Toronto and working with the municipalities uh, to say, this is the, this is the city we want to build. We don't want income disparity, and these are the things that we think that you can do to make it better. So Jack, you're now premier for a day. What's, uh, what do you do? Well, I'd have much more faith in the civil service than is now accorded. I think that there's a populist sense. In fact, I'd like to put up a little cartoon that appeared in New Yorker very recently. Would you mind getting that up on the screen? And I'll, it, it explains a great deal of what I'm talking about. So, um, the, no doubt the councillors in Scarborough know a great deal about transportation systems. Uh, but I think that uh, Metrolinx and others have a better view, and we don't pay enough attention to uh, civil service, nor do we give them, who are there for the public interest, enough weight to what they say. The OMB can turn over a, a majority of council. Uh, council can vote for a one-stop subway that's going to cost $3.5 billion, take longer to build than a LRT system, serve less people, will have a capacity that's never filled, and that p passes for politics. I think what we need is professionalism, and I think as, as Premier, I would see to it that the weight of the experts were given much more attention. That's a good example of what would happen if you don't. So let me ask you something. You know, it's really interesting because a conversation came up on the weekend and there's all these competing objectives that we need and there's a limited amount of capacity that we have. And so someone asked me, um, so the rail deck park that we've talked about in downtown Toronto mm. or that's been talked about. So, you know, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Now, maybe we could take the $3.5 billion from the Scarborough subway and be the rail deck and we'd be done. And uh, maybe that's a better sell, choice. Uh, you wouldn't have to sell hydro for a billion dollars, bill, $1.6 billion, but, one billion of which will go to a useless subway. On the other hand, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, on the other hand, you know, somebody said to me, uh, you know, we do have this problem in the inner suburbs and, you know, Scarborough needs some form of transportation and why are we putting, you know, a billion dollars or whatever that rail deck park will cost. It's right across from the well, so I like it. But, uh, uh, but um, uh, which was by coincidence. But you know, the, the, the issue is, you know, is that um, a, a good use in a time of uh, limited funds uh, of what we should be so pursuing? Or is it a great legacy that we should be going after? Sarah, what's your thought on that? I haven't meditated a great deal on the rail deck park. Um, you know, I'm always cautious about um, 
saying money should not be spent on parks and, and culture because I think that um, you know we need to do it in a really planful way though and look at priorities and look at where parks are needed where cultural infrastructure and investment is needed and how to create not just legacy culture but um, what we could describe as temporary culture because I believe that green space and um, you know culture which go very closely together libraries are about quality of life and they're about building communities so I haven't spent a lot of time angsting about that. What I have spent a lot of time thinking about is more on the analytics side. I work um, really closely with Eric Miller at U of T, who's a brilliant, brilliant uh, guy who basically works on transportation and transit planning, um, and really looking at the relationship. And we do the visualization work, so that's where we fit. Um, really looking at the relationship between real estate value, transit investment, underserved communities, and poverty. And I think that um, what we really need to pay attention to is both, as Jack said, the civil service with their knowledge, but also that kind of research which really, really clearly shows these are smart decisions that you could make about transit. This is how you actually serve an underserved community with the right level of support, help to bring them out of poverty, and how you also can make other transit um, decisions that use data, <laughs> you know, use a kind of rational, um, analytic perspective and the kind of uh, professional excellence that we need. So I actually think some of the same logic has to be um, applied to where you invest in parks and where you put money for culture and cultural infrastructure. Chicago has done an incredible job in, in their cultural plan that, re that uses data analytics, cultural analytics, and it looks at how to use culture and cultural development, citing cultural infrastructure along transit lines, using it to develop communities, ensuring there's affordability for artists um, so that they don't get pushed out of neighborhoods when they, when they develop as cultural hubs. So um, more rational planning and more of a sense of spreading that capacity across you know, the larger urban core. So urban, you know, urban fabric, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting, you know, in Chicago, I mean, it's a different environment. And um, they don't, uh, they have a, a, a lot more money that they put in from the municipal, federal, and provincial, go or, or state governments into those things because actually they're not funding a healthcare system at the same time. Mm -hmm. And even in the private sector, uh, sure. the parks and everything, they, they seem to get, I guess it's a wealthier country, but they have the huge contributions to help, to help with those things. There's that bit of a gap. So, you know, how do we, you're both artists. I mean, how do we, how do we balance the need for for uh, culture parks and yet the other uh, issues that we've talked about transit and affordability how do you balance that Jack well I remember going back again to Ann Golden's uh, commission we went to the locator companies in the uh, in the world that direct the fortune 400 where to invest <clears throat> and uh, they gave us a list of 10 as I remember 10 criteria um, access to markets uh, education of the population, the level of your digital system, and so forth. And they were very smart. I mean, this is, this is in 1996, mm -hmm. so it's a long time ago. They already saw that our, we were falling behind on our transportation system. They said, you, you did have the best transit system in the continent. You don't have it anymore. It's going down. You're w way ahead on uh, high-speed uh, internet, but your, but your uh, competitive edge is your quality of life. And it's the very thing that conservative governments cut. They think it's smart to cut on culture, cut on parks, cut on all the good things that are actually are the competitive edge in the business world. Because when somebody is going to make a decision of where to locate, mm -hmm. they want to know where their children will go to school. They want to know where their husbands are going to spend their spare time while they're at the office. Uh, all that kind of thing, they need to know all that. So. So in, in, uh, in terms of... Um, Good International Women's Day call. Right, well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got all these balance. So there's another issue that we have to balance in terms of our cities, and that is one of uh, good urban design. And uh, you're both uh, very accomplished in that particular area. And it seems that a lot of the time it's the public institutions that are leading the way in that. Uh, why do you think that is, and do you think we're demanding enough from the, uh, from the private sector? Well, um, part of why we're able to play that leadership role, frankly, has been because there's been consistent bursts of investment, um, you know, from the federal government and at times from the provincial government. So recently, um, we've all been blessed with um, 
what's called SIF funding, so it's the Strategic Investment Fund, um, from the federal government. Now, the problem with it, it, it was given a sort of like 18-month, 24-month run time, so you had to have shovels in the ground, pirouette, and start digging, um, which isn't a good way to actually undertake great urban planning, but it still means that institutions that, um, and what we do is we plan years in advance. So we think about what infrastructure we need, and then when the money flows, you're actually able to take advantage of that. Um, <clears throat> so part of why we've been successful is that there's been um, investment by government and then leverage with um, you know, private investors in much of our infrastructure. Um, and I think that universities, um, this is also true of cultural institutions, and you named, of course, the amazing work that um, Diamond and Schmidt have done. Um, you know, we, we really think through design as a principle, it is our brand. Uh, you know, great design has to be there because um, you need to be able to really um, represent that kind of intellectual and creative capacity of your institution. Um, so I think the same values, again, it's about value-driven de design. It's about thinking, how do you want to represent your community? And um, really asking the developer community. And I think there's some really beautiful um, urban development that's um, in the condo space, by the way. You know, really, though, asking uh, for partnership with the developer community to really bring that quality of design to the table. And so, I think there are examples. So, Jack, are we over-regulating, under-regulating? What's going on today in terms well, of I remember uh, it used to be <clears throat> that an area that wasn't within a quarter of a mile of a park was considered deficient in the city. So I think that uh, there's no reason why the soft infrastructure, by that I mean by clinics and schools and libraries, parks and recreation facilities, uh, should be just as uh, important a, a criterion in judging density. See, right now we've got an ask about face, so to speak. Uh, we, we say you can build this and we'll build the infrastructure later. One of the ways that we could get really rapid investment in the public sector is to say to the private sector, you can have any density you want uh, as soon as all the infrastructure is there to support it. There'd be huge pressure then to spend money on getting that stuff done. We're not doing that. We're doing it the other way around in the hope that we'll have stuff later on to support it. So like Crombie did in a long time ago, put the 45-foot height bylaw in to hold everything down until they got the right plan. Well, I, I have yeah. to tell you, Jack, there I would, I would uh, disagree with you as a oh. panelist. <laughs> I, and I, I have to tell you, I mean, I'll just I give you. I would be surprised if you had. No, no, but I'll just, I'll just give you a, a realistic example. <laughs> um, you put, you know, you'll put that bylaw on. No one will, no, nothing will be built. Uh, you'll say, um, you know, build us, uh, build us a subway. But you know, I can tell you that the amount of profit and development won't pay for a 3.5 billion dollar subway no, along the won't. line. So, so yeah. I think there has to be a balance uh, along the way about what you're going to be expecting because you know we demand a lot already in terms of what's, what is taken out of, of the, of the uh, development. So I was looking the other day, you know, for a $600,000 unit, 150000 is already taxes going to the government. So Steve, there's a lot I, of stuff you, going on. I pushed on. the right button, that's clear. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it's, it's nothing to do with the private sector paying for it. It's seeing that the public sector gets it done. Now, what I think is wonderful about Canada, and I'm proud that I've got to a stage where I pay a lot of tax. I think that's fantastic, and I love paying that tax, because I know what I'm getting for it. Canadians want tax value, not tax cuts. Right. I actually do agree with that. I think mm -hmm. we end up in an, an American rhetoric that's really like not about, um, really, again, the value system. And one thing I would love to see, which is um, uh, really an exciting set of programs in London um, and in the UK, is that artists are actually at the table with developers um, and architects at the very beginning of large-scale urban planning. So really looking at, and, and cultural institutions, so saying, don't bring the artist in at the end with a 1% you know, or a section 37. Look at how you actually work with the artists and the sense of creativity and how to vitalize spaces and design. And that artist doesn't necessarily get a contract to do an artwork. It's really about thinking about urban space as always being cultural space always having this quality where it's an engaged, where there's street value, um, and where the quality of life is one of, the, you know, one of the things that's at stake. And it's not always about building that particular artwork. It's about building the quality of a built environment. Yeah. So I just want to say a couple of things. I do too. OK. <laughs> <laughs> we got about 10 minutes here. First of all, I want to go on the record. I did publicly support the land transfer tax when it came in in the city of Toronto, to the great chagrin of some of my uh, peers. 
So I happen to agree with you. And in fact, in terms of getting value for your tax money, I think the fact that the public was prepared to accept uh, in the city of Toronto road tolls, mm -hmm. which was a very, very big psychological move, uh, and that the mayor was prepared to do it because he must have felt there was support. I mean, it's a shame that it didn't get turned down. Was again showing that people understand that they have to. We have to understand that we all have Things to pay. Have to be paid for yeah. My only point is it's a shared, uh, a shared responsibility. But Jack, I want to I want to get to this one other point with you about urban design. Um, you know, I'm finding in the city now that they're they're very much regulating exactly the type and shape of your buildings. And I'm personally worried about architectural creativity for the future. I agree. And I, I want to know what, what your views are on that. Well, I, I agree with and you. And Sarah, after, if Jack will let you. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I, I do think that we do have prescriptive requirements. What we need are performance requirements. And I think that if we had performance requirements, you'd unleash all kinds of creativity. That's the way to do it. You can say you can build any density you like as long as you give sunlight to everybody for 45 minutes a day or some other social right. dimension and say, go to it. As, and I think that way you could actually state the public interest that you've got to provide the kind of animation at street level that gives yeah. the Jane Jacobs kind of security by eyes on the street, whatever the performance standards are, and let the designers go to it to find new ways to do it. The prescriptive one is saying, we've got the solution, and now you're going to have to follow it. That's never a good way. So th there's, a, you know, there's a revolution in material science right now. That's so exciting in terms of architecture and the built space. Mm. And um, one of my concerns is that um, we should be and could be at the foreground of that. I mean, we have companies that are Canadian companies that have that capacity. That work's happening in labs. There's experiments in other places in the world. Um, with built form and new materials, and even in our challenging climate, in fact, you know, really resilient materials for our climate. And if there's um, uh, a kind of over restriction of both materials and form, we're not going to be able to really move forward and also build a resilient city. Um, and um, I was part of the great, you know, Mervish Gary um, fight in this city, which was really. Um, quite interesting how that played out because city planning had this idea of this clothesline horizon, you know, mm -hmm. like, right? Um, yeah. And the problem with Mervish Gary is it poked, you know, clearly through that horizon. Now, it doesn't fit Jack's comments on infrastructure by any means. Um, it was really about build it and we'll create the infrastructure. But that's a very important development for the city of Toronto. Um, I don't only support it because we're getting 25,000 square feet in it, um, you know. <laughs> But I support it because it's a beautiful building mm -hmm. and it will actually puncture the clothesline. It will create something dynamic and sculptural. Um, so I think we have to have much more flexibility. Uh, I also think that we should be really looking at density um, around transit points um, and how to plan density in a much more kind of dynamic way in, um, in neighborhoods where um, you know it's single family housing, but you actually build up that density and that capacity. So. Um, we do need to change the way that we're thinking about this, and I, I, I do believe that we shouldn't have engineered buildings. We should have architect designed buildings in the city. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with both of what you said, and, and I do have a concern with the, with the amount of regulation and some of the buildings that, you know, with the well, which was called enlightened urbanism, I don't know if we could build that today with, uh, with what's going on. So I hope, um, hope there's a few city planners in the audience tonight <laughs> to, uh, to, to, uh, to listen to that, to listen to that comment. So one of the, uh, you know, one of the other major issues um, that we hear every day is with respect to this issue of housing affordability. Mm -hmm. And it's clear, you know, that if some developers say it's supply, uh, other people say it has nothing to do with supply, uh, that it's to do with speculation and foreign buyers, uh, other people say it's interest rates, and it's frankly a combination of all these factors, but I don't think the issue is why it's happening, the question is it's happening, and it is an issue, you know, artists can't afford to live in the city. Many people can't afford Students to live in the city. Um, we could get to the point where the service people that are necessary to service the city can't live in the city. Um, I don't know whether you've thought about it, but are there any, Sarah, do you think there's any creative solutions to this? Are we, are we not doing enough? Are governments, the private sector, not working enough together on it? What's, what are we going to do? It's, it's a real fundamental issue that we're all, we're all dealing with. 
Oh, actually, I, I'm quite obsessed with it. I mean, our, our student union just did this amazing um, survey about um, you know, student poverty, and, and it was actually really shocking. Um, it was data that they collected that was beyond what the university had. Um, and um, it's really clear that, that you know, the student population um, in the GTA is having an incredibly hard time um, really going to school here. We were part of initiative, I should just step back and say the four um, presidents have um, a coalition and we undertake initiatives and our first initiative was something called Student Move Toronto. We collected the largest data set of, in North America of how students get to school. And that data included where they live, why they decide where they're going to live, what transit they take, um, how they go to work, daycare, pick up their kids, etc. And from that data, it is very, very clear that students are finding it increasingly difficult to live in the city. They're being forced further and further away from where they go to school. And the implications of that are that they're not getting the quality of education that they need. Most students, um, over 60% of students in the four universities work. That's the economy. And they go to school. So our next initiative um, is um, looking at student housing. And we've challenged our faculty to come out with uh, really dynamic new ways of thinking about affordable student housing. But we need to do that with the developer community. So we're looking at things like um, unused sites. Um, a lot of hospitals, for example, have gone um, to ambulatory care. There's actually um, wards that aren't used that could be turned into student housing. We're looking at any kind of structures within the kind of reasonable periphery of student travel where there could be built space for student housing. Um, we're looking at micro housing and uh, you know, thinking about much smaller units and what those could be for students and then how those can, tra can transform into other kinds of housing. But this is, um, this is a project I think that it's not only students, I think it's a huge responsibility again for the city on a municipal planning level working with the developer community to, um, to, to really um, examine. We really don't want to move into a world that's like um, you know, um, the emerging world where you have wealth at the center and the service community at, and poverty right. at the edge. It's not a way that I think any of us want to live in Canada. That's a good point. I, I, um, I hope that those are great thoughts. I hope that the sect private sector, us, I'd be happy to help and, and other people's help. I always think there's, you know, we're a partnership between all, all the different segments, the private and public sector, and I don't think we do work uh, enough together. But Jack, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Well, I was going to turn the tables on you. What, did you, what do you think of uh, the city's nonprofit housing corporation when it was active? in developing Crombie Park? Well, I think at the time when they did Crombie uh, Park, it was, it was a good idea. Um, I think that the, um, you know, going back to, um, uh, to uh, the, the uh, Ann Golden's report, uh, it was really interesting on affordable housing. I, I think one of the issues that people don't recognize is that uh, the issue of affordable housing is really an income issue. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that people don't have enough money to buy uh, to buy the homes. And so what we have to do is look at ways and means for all forms of government and the private sector to work together so that people can have the incomes to move in to the houses. And at the time, I believe, uh, made strong recommendations to what was called the rent supplement program. So people would, wouldn't live in isolated nonprofit projects. They would live in private sector projects, but the rent would be supplemented by the government. And I always thought that was a, a great idea. It didn't seem to, I don't know what happened uh, to, the, uh, to the program over the years, but I thought it was a, um, uh, a, a great idea in terms of moving forward. Um, so again, I think it's a shared responsibility, and I think that the uh, governments, the, the, the private sector and the public sector have to come to grips and say, look, this is an issue. I think the private sector has a greater responsibility to come forward. I think the public sector has a greater responsibility to come forward and find new creative ideas. There's, there's some form for some public housing. I would like to see uh, more, I would like to see people more integrated into private development because I think it's healthier. I, uh, I think that we as, a, as a, an industry, through incentives, through density incentives, through other incentives, can provide the housing. I think the days of saying we can't market a building in fact, I was talking about we, we, we do have buildings where we have affordable units in them today. It was part of our 37. We have OCAD units, for example, in mm -hmm. some of our buildings. Um, and, um, and it's working, and we haven't had a problem selling them. So I think we have an obligation to accommodate them, I think partly to finance them, and I think the public sector 
uh, has to come to the table, and everybody has to recognize this is an income issue. You know, it's a, uh, uh, it's a shared, it's a shared uh, responsibility. The income issue is going to be very interesting as Canada moves forward because there's um, such um, an acute recognition right now about the impact of machine learning and artificial intelligence and um, job displacement. And so the conversation about a basic living wage you know, for um, sectors of the population that are displaced as well as you know, what the future of employment will be is, it's really on the agenda right now. And I think you know, combining that conversation with urban af affordability, um, the, the, the pieces need to intersect. So it's actually a very right moment for that discussion again. Well, yeah, anyway, I hope it happens. It is important for the future of the city. So I have uh, one more topic, and then I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions of advice, and we'll open it for some questions. But the last area I just wanted to uh, ask your views on, because you're both uh, so creative in, 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 your, in your careers, is technological innovation. And you know, I was reading in the Globe uh, last weekend about a city, a small city in Alberta called uh, St. Albert. And the whole city, they've called it a smart city. Mm -hmm. You know, the lights turn on and off automatically. I was reading that they're planning um, for completely self-driving cars that they say the city will be in, in the next five years. They're planning for it today. Um, where are we headed with this? Is that where we're going? Sarah, what do you think? It, it better be where we're going. <laughs> um, you know, I think for Toronto to be competitive, uh, we need to um, really move forward with the smart city infrastructure. And, um, I'm on the Smart City Working Group with the Toronto Regional Board of Trade and the City of Toronto. Um, and um, uh, what this is really, again, um, is the first principles are what are the values of the city and how do you harness an integrated network of technology um, that is emerging from Internet of Things, um, sensor systems, um, data collection and analysis to be able to really effectively plan um, deal with issues of sustainability, look at um, the capacity of the city to resist intensive climate change, look at water management, waste management. Um, this is really a shifting environment and the Prince Albert story is like a little microcosm of actually things that have been happening in Europe, Barcelona for example, for, for over a decade. The Europeans are far ahead of us on these issues because they've been very um, anxious about um, their energy consumption because of the kind of Russian control of, of oil and energy. And now in North America, you know, there are model cities um, that are really engaged in this process. It's also very much about flipping the paradigm so that citizens or residents are involved in urban planning, are part of the process of finding solutions, um, looking at what's happening in their neighborhoods, helping city, municipal, um, divisions serve them more effectively. So I think we really um, are at a very, again, important moment where the technologies exist, the capacity to do this exists, but it really requires the kind of integrated urban planning that Jack actually started our conversation with. It's about Toronto, but it's also how we lace this, um, you know, again, into the GTA, and it's also about how the developer community builds buildings that have the right kind of capacity um, to really be part of this wired world that um, really is our very near future. No question, huge impact in terms of transportation. And the first smart transportations will be really public transit. Um, you know, it won't be driverless cars. It'll be the transit system and how to make that more efficient, how to make sure that you deal with, um, you know, issues of breakdown, stock, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, fares and uh, making sure people can move seamlessly uh, between um, you know, parts of the city and regions. So really, I think we'll be in that space. Um, whether or not a large urban center like Toronto will actually move to um, you know, um, the next generation of individual vehicles, that's, that's to be seen. Jack? Well, I'd love to hear some questions from the audience, but the, uh, the, the, it's already happening. I mean, if you're de designing a building for the federal government, you have to produce a building which, I don't remember the exact number, but they give you a performance standard that it can't consume more than X kilowatt hours per square meter per year. You figure out how you're going to do it. And I think you could extend that so that you would set the standards, which is, I would think, what a national government should be doing, whether it's for transportation, saying, you know, what we should be doing in terms of performance standards, say to governments who are looking for infrastructure money to spend on their transit system, saying, demonstrate to us that you can improve the modal split 
between public and private sector from 10 to 90 to 30 to 17 will give you the money. We could, set, we could begin to set performance standards at the, at the national level that would improve generally. People would watch and say, oh, that's how those guys got the money. We'll try it too. So there are all kinds of ways from the mega, from the macro level of national planning down to the micro level of a building. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've already begun it ourselves in having a, something we've registered called Echometrics, where we've measured every one of the buildings we've ever done to look at their uh, energy consumption, their water consumption, and measure that and then begin to say, this is because we're doing it internally, next time we do a building, we've got to beat that by 10%, and there's a, a national standard about what you should be doing, and I've forgotten what its number is, SAE 90 or some such figure, what the hell it is, but the fact is that it's been set. And so there are already those things, and therefore you oblige people if you say that's the, that's the standard you have to meet in order to either get financing or to get approval for your plans. That's the standard you have to meet, and you'll get it done. So I'd like to um, uh, conclude by asking uh, each of you um, a question about what advice uh, you would give to people today uh, in terms of, um, to the younger audience about, you know, what piece of advice would you give them in terms of pursuing uh, their careers? I, I just think it's um, one of those sublime moments um, where um, really strong design skills, foresighting and design thinking skills, which is how you understand, you know, kind of future um, markets and, and users, and know how to work with people in the planning process, um, need to combine with um, kind of baseline um, techno technological knowledge. So, you know, what are the new materials that are going to be coming on stream? And uh, how do you actually understand and use data effectively within um, your discipline? Um, because those, those, those components, the design capacity, the business capacity as well, and the analytics capacity really are about the future. Jack? Uh, it's a very hard question to answer, because um, I've been so fortunate in my life doing what I want to do. But I think that you've got to, ha I think I would advise people to say you shouldn't have a job. You should have something you love doing. Sounds good. And the only thing I would add to that was, you know, when you, when you at the beginning, uh, you talked about uh, coming to Canada and that one of the best things that happened to you was you were fired from uh, U of T. U of T. And was, I thought he was about a sort of proto-Trump. Yeah. So, he you didn't know, like opposition. It, exactly, exactly. And I was looking back at my career and thought of all the times that I failed and uh, had to get up and dust, the, mm -hmm. dust off and move forward. So that's my, true. my only thought would be don't be afraid to fail. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, that's so, very true. So, because um, uh, you pick yourself up and move, move forward. Anyway, um, those are uh, kind of the, uh, the parts of, uh, that I had out for the panel, and, and I think at this point in time, uh, I understand uh, I'm supposed to ask if um, people have any questions. Yes, can, oh, go ahead. I can start off, just, but please formulate your questions. Richard Wick, you're always asking the best question. <laughs> the controversial question, so uh, no, 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 get ready. But my question is, if there's a global Zeitgeist, it's surely this notion of populism that's, that's emerging everywhere, it seems. And um, we, of course, probably experienced that before much of the world uh, here in Toronto. But you think about city building, it's, it's nece necessarily transformative. It's evol evolving a lot of change, whether that's in private development or public infrastructure or public realm. It's involving change that, at the front end, communities probably don't necessarily want or they're not easily going to embrace. Maybe after the fact, they'll say that that was great, love it. But um, we have a lot more transformation to come in this city region, which is gonna rub up against a lot of communities who, who don't want it. It's not a new story, but it's probably a, an ever-growing story. How do we involve communities better in terms of embracing some of the necessary, good, a beneficial transformation um, that, that they perhaps intuitively don't want. I, I mean, I just think that's um, you know, such a fundamental design question and um, inclusive design um,
processes, and, and technology does give us some of the skills to engage people and have those conversations, you know, in terms of well-executed social media um, engagement. I think, you know, not doing token consultations with communities, but really being there, being present, understanding the community. Um, I think, frankly, hiring people from communities that are communities at risk, you know, it's about who is your workforce, you know, what kind of networks and relationships um, do you have? Um, and building processes where one iterates consistently and um, engage people so that you can galvanize those debates and those opinions and help, and actually sometimes find solutions, and Canadians actually are quite good at this, you know, finding solutions that, that are, one would call compromises, but in many ways aren't because they're collaboratively designed. So. Um, that's certainly how I try and lead my very complex university environment, you know, as a microcosm. But it's very much about being on the ground with people, both vi virtually and also physically. Jack? I think that uh, this, there's never been a time that's more important for informed people, such as those in this room, uh, to really demonstrate why change might be a good thing. No one likes change. Almost no one likes change. And I think that evidence-based design Evidence-based medicine is understandable. One has to really demonstrate that evidence-based outcomes that come from the way in which you plan and build a city, the way in which you plan and build and design a, a building or anything you do, evidence-based, the facts, the science of it, is missing in public debate in the United States where you have something called alternate facts. I only thought they were facts. I didn't know they were alternate facts. But the fact of the matter is that there is this growing sense that if you have an opinion, it's okay. It doesn't matter if it's not based on evidence. So I think we have all of us a duty to really do some very clear explaining of why one should do X or Y. You know, um, it, it was a really good question and I, I was thinking about it as well because uh, it may not last for much longer, but we're pretty proud of the fact that since we started this company and all of our projects, we have not had one uh, contested OMB hearing from our, the communities we've developed in. Mm -hmm. And um, we're very proud of that. And when I look back, it was partly about what you both said. We actually work very, very hard from the very beginning to educate the communities right. that we work in as to what we're trying to do. Exactly. And, and I think as well, you know, Jack, even to your latest point, you know, I think what the frustration is with people, it's not a matter of like going in and saying, uh, by the way, uh, you know, here's an, a 10-story building, what do you think of it? And that's what people's frustration is. Oh, they already designed this 10-story yeah. building. And, and people are very frustrated today with the way technology is and, and the frustration, and that's what the, why the Trump populism is. People are just feeling that they have no say anymore in what's, what's happening, when in reality, if everyone took the time, they would have the say, and the idea is to say, look, we have certain issues. So here's a site, right. and, which is on a smaller level. So we want to do something here. Before I put my pen to paper, here's my architects. Tell us what you think. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how that just little bit of a different approach, people feel they're then a part of it. And I think we have to work, in terms of that issue, work way harder. Governments have to work way harder, I think, to stop populist decisions. I think the private sector, we all have to work a lot harder to make sure that we're taking the time uh, to educate people Absolutely. Uh, uh, right from the and, beginning. And also the aesthetics have to reflect diversity. So, you know, one of the great things about the GTA is that it genuinely is culturally diverse. So what does that mean in terms of architecture, interior design, um, you know, the look and feel of a building? I think that's a really exciting, wonderful challenge to have. And, um, you know, people who feel marginalized and that they're not represented, and it's a very emotional thing. Um, those are the people who will um, be attracted to populism. And so finding those cultural expressions that are, you know, appropriate for communities, I think that's a, a grand challenge to have. And it also means making sure that we hire and we um, really have those voices inside our companies or our institutions. Great, yeah. Question for Jack. Jack, you've had the benefit and the privilege of working around the world and having come from uh, another part of the world to live here. What lessons have you applied from your experience elsewhere to Toronto? But more importantly, what experiences from Toronto have you applied to some of your work in the rest of the world? Well, I, I like to, uh, it's not working. I like to think that there are universal principles 
of paying attention to context. And the context can be physical or political or economic. So I think a sensitivity, and there's an apocryphal story about the wrong thing to do. A student asked Mies van der Rohe, Mr. van der Rohe, how would you design a building in the desert? Met steel and glass. How would you design it in the Arctic? Met steel and glass. <laughs> Mr. van der Rohe, isn't there a difference? Yeah, a question of proportion. Not true. It's, it, the fact of the matter is there are contextual differences. And I think that paying real attention to a local culture, uh, one of the things that it was so impressive about St. Petersburg, not the government, not the business uh, culture, but the physical continuity of the streets that paid a kind of homage to the big and important buildings like the great cathedrals. So the distinction between a public building, which was given huge importance, and the continuity of the street was consistently done across the city. And it's actually one of the extraordinary things that I don't think many people recognize in Toronto, how we give so much importance to our public buildings. They're the only ones that close the vista and break the grid. You look up York Street and you see the courts, uh, Osgoode Hall, Avenue, Apps Avenue Road, uh, you see the, the Parliament, the Old City Hall at the top of Bay Street, and a university building at the top of Spadina. It's very wonderful how we accord them that importance. So I think uh, it speaks to us. I really do think architecture is an inevitable expression of a culture's values. And we in Canada give huge importance to our institutions. And I think it's evident that that's the case. So that's number one. Number two, we have a world in which there's excessive individualism. It's capitalism, as the last pope said, that's gone too far. It's about the individual and not about the collective and the community. And so you get architects who will try in a beautifully consistent street to do some damn stupid thing. You know, they do this instead of this. Just make it simple and to pay attention to the context. And I think it's that question of the common interest that really should pervade wherever you are. Master Cosi. It's time for dinner, right? Oh, yes, go ahead. I think that um, last comment, actually, I was trying to formulate what question I would have, but I think the last comment kind of put it all together. I'm sort of curious if, if you could sort of expand on this idea or this notion of uh, how we build our urban environments vis-a-vis -a, -vis a democracy and representation of the community, which is a very sort of broad term that we haven't really defined. And how do you reconcile that with the slide that you showed earlier mm -hmm. about the expertise in practitioners and people in the industry or at the city. And then layered onto that, how do you reconcile the fact that the homage that you were talking about in St. Petersburg is a built environment that did not uh, come out of a democratic uh, True. process. True. So I'm very interested in that because I find that working in a democratic, highly um, diverse environment makes it very, difficult to create public spaces that are characterized by the principles of the age-old principles of space making. So how do, we, how do we get Toronto to be more like the cities that were built, if we want that, not during a democracy? Right. And is that something desirable? Oh, and I'm fascinated about the performance criteria as a, as a as a mechanism for that, if that's possible. It's a classic dilemma that you have, uh, you've uh, pronounced. I think a lot of the, the answer to that comes out of what both Steve and Sarah have been saying, is that in fact it is a question of consultation, it is a question of persuasion, it's a question of, in fact, uh, uh, engagement. But I think there's another way, because I think that uh, we don't have the, just as you point out, whether it's in Russia 
or whether it was a general taste and a limit to the amount of materials that you could use in the 18th and 17th centuries, which gave you a kind of cohesion anyway. And it was usually the patron, the lord of the manor, that set the style and that, and that it worked. And it doesn't work anymore. I think the way we can do it is having the, uh, the public armature provide that cohesion, that we have street systems and sidewalks. I mean, it's interesting that in, a, in the city I grew up with in South Africa, which was not rich as uh, 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 Toronto, made a rule that everyone, because the, there's a torrential downpour at a certain time of the, uh, the rainy season, the end of the monsoon would drench everything, and the summertime is extremely hot. In the commercial districts, people had to provide a canopy over the sidewalks connecting it, and you got this extended public sector really, although the private sector had to build a canopy so that you had protected sidewalks. Now, the sidewalk is the most ubiquitous public space in the city. We pay scant attention to it. If we were to have magnificently designed uh, sidewalks, whether it was done incrementally by each property owner, as was the case in the city I, I, I grew up in, or whether it was the public sector that did it, as the Romans did when they conquered a town in North Africa, they put a colonnade around the main square. It doesn't matter about what kind of hovels were around it, it gave it a kind of unity. If you take that principle and think about how we might do that now, so that you could have all of the individuality of an excessive and extreme uh, capitalism uh, that gives its uh, expression to every building being different, but you had some other mechanism to give it then we would reinvest in a way in a public sector that would make it quite grand. And incidentally, may, maybe it would be contextually appropriate to a place where we actually have snow in winter and uh, we need to protect the sidewalks instead of going below ground. So it's a, it's, a, it's a way, and I think that, again, it would take public policy in an enlightened way to think of the principle and then f figure out how it should be executed, whether it's through the private or the public sector or combination. It's a thought. But it is a tremendous dilemma that you say, you know, if you, you, you see something that really would be wonderful, that it would be in the public interest, it's something new and it's rejected. It's heartbreaking and it happens. But you can't force it. It's a democracy. So that's the dilemma. Uh, yes? Sorry, did you have a question or? No, oh, hi. Uh, at the beginning of the night, you mentioned something about Toronto and how you know, we're developing at a city and the world doesn't really know what we're gonna turn into, which is actually pretty cool if you think about everything that's going on in Toronto right now. Um, asking someone who specializes in taking a underutilized asset and transforming that into something that makes it the best and highest use, whether that be a church on St. Clair that you turn into a high-rise site, a Global Mail site that's sitting there to turn into a new city or a, you know, um, an aerospace center on Celestica lands into another bigger city. What do you think is the most underutilized asset in Toronto? And it could be the waterfront, it could be the railway roads, it could be even more than that. What is something that you could transport to help shape what Toronto is going to be? Well, I'm going to answer that by saying I wouldn't, I would say, uh, I wouldn't look to a particular physical asset. I actually think that one of the most underutilized parts of the city is something that we've been talking about, is that to make this city grow and, and be energized and be healthy and safety and vibrant, that the greatest resource that we have that's underutilized is getting our governments, our public sector, our private sector, the arts community, and getting people to talk more and to develop more partnerships, like I did with the pay partnership, so that we can accomplish better objectives and not be so much in our different silos. I think the future is going to depend on less populism in terms of our governments making rash decisions, and, and the public s sector and the private sector. The private sector, I think, has to step up a lot. So as much as I'd like to point to a particular asset, because I think there are many, I really believe, and my, and my biggest concern is that we aren't working together enough. We, there are so many great talents in this city, and if we could just marshal them and put them together, we will have a great future. 
And having on that, said that, on that note, and on that note, uh, I've been told I'm to conclude the evening. So uh, I thank you uh, very, very much. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. <Sarah. laughs> nice to be with you. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. Hello, my name is Ornella Rikiki, and I'm the co-chair of ULI's Toronto's Women's Leadership Initiative, WLI, along with Meg Davis. WLI's focus is to promote the advancement of women throughout their careers as leaders in the real estate and development industry. Through our four key initiatives of WLI, being the championship team, She With He, Women on Boards, and the mentorship program, we hope to achieve greater visibility and leadership opportunities for women in our industry. I'm very pleased to take this opportunity on International Women's Day to very briefly speak to you about three upcoming WLI events and in initiatives that we hope you will join us for. The 2017 Mentorship Program, kicking off at the end of the month. There are a few spots left for mentors and we would like for you to consider volunteering as a mentor. It only takes a couple of hours a month and it is incredibly rewarding experience. We also have a few more spots for mentees with applications open until the end of this week. The 2017 championship team, now in its third year, we are accepting nominations for professionals in our industry to recognize the talent and contributions in the Toronto real estate and land use sector. A celebration event of the 2017 inductees will soon be announced at a later date. Women on Boards, by popular demand, we will soon announce a second program oriented towards recruiting women to serve on corporate boards. This time the focus will be on the public sector. The United Nations has declared the theme for this year's International Women's Day as Be Bold for Change to inspire improved opportunities and equal representation for women in a changing world of work. A bold goal to eliminate the workplace gender gaps by 2030 has been set. However, it will certainly take a redefining of both women and men's roles and responsibilities, both at home and at work, for this brave goal to be achieved. But we can do it. And with that, it is my duty now to once again thank tonight's event sponsors, Bousfields, ERA Architects, and RealCan. And of course, please join me once again in thanking our amazing 2017 Fireside Chat panel, Sarah, Jack, and Steve Diamond. Thank you and good night.